million years BC erupts on the screen with volcanic excitement. One million years BC, when the earth parted and the mountains fell. Primitive man and monstrous beasts fought each other to inherit the earth. Ray Harryhausen, an absolute master. I think up there with the likes of Roald Dahl and Lewis Carroll for the way he shaped our imagination as children and as adults. And there's a brilliant new book on the way about Ray Harryhausen called Harryhausen, The Lost Movies. And I'm delighted to welcome Two Chot Radio, the author of that book, John Walsh, who's also an award-winning filmmaker in his own right. He's made TV series, he's made feature films, but he's a Ray Harryhausen enthusiast like me, and he's with us now. Good morning, John, and congratulations on this beautiful-looking book. Good morning, Paul, and thanks very much. I'm very excited to be speaking to you again about Ray Harryhausen. Now, it's called The Lost Movies. Um, How did you find out about these Harryhausen projects? Where did this research come from? Well, really, over the years, I met Ray when I was an 18-year-old film student back in the late 80s, and, you know, I used to speak to Ray about films he didn't make and would be things I'd read in Starburst magazine and Starlog, Sinbad Goes to Mars and Force of the Trojans. And I'd say to Ray, you know, what happened to these films? What happened to these projects? And he'd say to me, oh, I don't want to talk about those films. Um, So he he would be reluctant. It's a bit like pulling teeth. He wouldn't talk about the films that weren't made. So when I became a trustee of his foundation, I thought, well, I'm going to get to grips with this because I think there might be a book in there somewhere. And uh, the publisher, Titan Books, said to me, how many films do you think might be, you know, lost movies, John? And I said, it could be as many as 45 or 50. Anyway, two years after writing the book, it turns out there's nearly 80. Wow. I mean, that shows you how fertile the man's imagination is. The book isn't out until until next month. I've only seen a kind of version of an advanced copy of it. So what are some of your favourite? What Which ones of these lost movies would you most like to have seen come to fruition, to see on the big screen, John? Well, I think, I suppose, um, the one which had the most development materials was Force of the Trojans, which would have been the next film after Clash of the Titans. And so there's a fully developed screenplay for that. It was going to be even bigger than Clash with more monsters and 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 sort of more sort of Greek mythology brought to life. Um, but there were some interesting ones as well. So there was the films you'd expect there to be, Paul, like, you know, the unmade Sinbad and the unmade mythology stuff. But um, he was involved with so many other films and was asked to be involved with other films. So, for example, like, did you know, Paul, he turned down the first Marvels movie in 1984? I did not. Which one would that have been then? Um, Stan Lee approached him to do um, an X-Men movie in 1984 with a full script, which we have in the Foundation's archive. And, uh, and Ray had to, uh, had to decline. Uh, it was the same year he also declined working with David Lynch. And what on earth did Lynch want him to work on? Would that have been June? It was, exactly, Paul. Yeah, it was June. It was one of my favourite films. I love June, despite the fact it has a lot of of detractors. And, of course, Ray was asked to be involved with the third stage Guild Navigator and the enormous sandworms as well. So it's fascinating how other people see him from the outside by the offers that he got. There are so many films I love, and we all love that he was. We, we played a clip of one. He did Jason and the Argonauts, of course. Um, he did uh, One Million Years BC. Tell us a bit about the man. How did he get his start? Because I think he worked initially, didn't he, with Willis O'Brien, the stop motion animator of King Kong? That's right. That was his first sort of feature films break on The Mighty Joe Young. Uh, before that, he'd been a puppeteer. He'd made his own films at home. He'd done his own sort of 16 millimeter experiments. And he made some children's fairy tales, Um, the fairy tales, um, you know, like uh, Rapunzel, Hansel and Gressel, that kind of thing. And they would have been sold to schools and would have been shown sort of regularly in in sort of uh, Saturday matinee theatres. So he kind of cut his teeth on that sort of family friendly animation. But you're right, it was Mighty Joe Young with King Kong's creator, Willis O'Brien, where he... um, well, he really hit the big time because it was it was sort of feature films uh, from then onwards. And in fact, we can hear the trailer of Mighty Joe Young now. Have a listen to this, folks. Here's the kind of movie you're waiting to see as John Ford and Miriam C. Cooper present Mighty Joe Young, whose sensational exploits will startle you, thrill you, electrify you with hair-raising excitement and suspense. See Mighty Joe Young as he savagely resists capture in his native Africa. Oh! See the most fantastic relationship between beast and beauty. A mere girl mastering a primitive giant. See mighty Joe Young, enraged by Hollywood pranksters, destroy Filmland's swankiest nightclub on the fabulous Sunset Strip. Mighty 
Joe Young, the picture that's alive with the most sensational action thrills ever filmed. Mightier than King Kong, Mighty Joe Young. I still love that film, and I interviewed Kid Creole many years ago, and he said that film influenced his whole style, that kind of weird Cuban tropical look he went for. Um, you've also got some great contributions from iconic filmmakers in this new book, which, as I say, folks, is called Harry Howes and the Lost Movies, out next month by John Walsh, John Borman, Guillermo del Toro, Mike Hodges, even John Landis. How did you get in touch with these people? Obviously all fans of Harry Howes, and was that tough getting them to contribute, John? And well, I'm pleased to say John Landis is a very big fan of the uh, of Ray's work and the foundation. And I would often bump into John Landis when he'd come over to visit Ray at his house in in Holland Park. And Ray first met uh, John Landis when John was making American Werewolf in London, in London, and Ray was making Clash of the Titans in Pinewood. So they they got to know each other over that film. Um, Guillermo del Toro is a big fanboy. So much more like us, Paul, yep. um, in that you just love those films and grew up with them. Um, the other directors are people that I kind of met through my own sort of work. So uh, John Borman and Mike Hodges I've been involved with previously. And although they're not obvious Harryhausen fanboys, I wanted to get a different perspective so that we get to hear from other filmmakers about their own unmade films and, and whether or not it's a great creative process or whether it's a terrible burden. And so we have this forward from five famous faces, as it were, five famous directors, and Nick Meyer there from Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, nicely yeah. rounds things off. And these are people you wouldn't normally expect to hear from. So we want people to to pick up the book and, and hear from people they they wouldn't normally expect to hear from, which is fabulous. Now, I've mentioned you're a filmmaker, a warbling filmmaker yourself, and a lot of your work focuses on, on social justice. I wonder if in any way your fascination with Ray Harryhausen, your love of Harryhausen's creativity, is almost the kind of the counterbalance to that, because it couldn't be more removed from some of the work that you've done. Yes, no, my yeah, you're quite right, Paul. My, my work, which involves sort of social mobility, social justice, politics and so on, tends to be sort of quite a um, realistic fare. Um, I've, I've always been a fan of, of fantasy cinema. And when I was a film student and before that, when I was in sort of secondary school, it would be the film magazines like Starburst and Starlog, where you'd find out how things were done and how techniques were created and made. You know, there were very few sort of fanboy magazines about, um, you know, maybe John Borman or, or, or Ken Loach. It would be the more fantastical films that would be written about more extensively. And those films tend to have more longevity as well. Um, but I used to love it when my parents would bring me to those films and they, they sort of indelibly sort of uh, marked on my brain. So it, it was great. I mean, Ray would discuss with me about making documentaries for television or some of the feature film work that I have done. Uh, he, he would always be curious as to, you know, what would motivate me. Um, I made a film about the death of Henry VIII. And, uh, so quite a grim affair. Um, but, uh, you know, Ray was always fascinated by other people's processes and deals that they would strike and so on. Um, but I've only had two films in the cinema. Ray had 16, wow. which if anyone's ever tried to get a film in the cinema, they'll know doing one is an enormous task and challenge. To do it 16 times is, uh, is pretty impressive. Now, I remember when we got our first phone back in the early 70s to mid-70s, then along came the phone book. And flicking through it one day, I saw R. Harryhausen in uh, you know, a London phone number, and I rang him up. I think I've told you this before. I rang him up, and he was very pleasant. I was kind of a hello, slightly nervous 14-, 15-year-old and had a you know, little conversation, just said, oh, so much of admire of your work, couldn't believe it was you in the phone book. Never then contacted him again. How did he come to end up in London? What Was it, was it because of Pinewood? Um, not quite. What it was was um, it, it was it was something quite um, um, specific, really. Himself and the producer, Charles Schneer, set up shop here because... The yellow sodium backing process, which is what the Walt Disney Company used a lot to incorporate live action and animation with films like Mary Poppins and, and, uh, and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Um, they could afford to do it in the UK with UK laboratories, with the budgets they were getting from right. Columbia Pictures, whereas in the US they wouldn't have been able to have afforded it under the same union rules. So the Teamsters unions and others, which were quite um, strong in the day, would mean that you'd need a certain minimum amount of crew and so on. So with the budgets that Ray and Charles had, the films, the Sinbads, the Gullivers and so on, wouldn't have been possible. So it was actually much cheaper to come here, not as a tax benefit, but in terms of the creativity and the lab and the laboratory costs. And of course, later then, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas worked in 
uh, Pinewood and Elstree because of the great technicians and, and the wonderful sound stages uh, for Raiders as Lost Ark and, uh, and Star Wars and Superman and what have you. But of course, Ray and Charles Schneer did it first. They were the first Hollywood pioneers of, of uh, British film industry. Well, as John was saying, Ray Harryhausen got 16 films onto the big screen, but there are Lost Movies as well, which is the title of John's latest book, Harryhausen, The Lost Movies, published by Titan. It's out on the 10th of September, an absolutely beautiful-looking volume. John, let's talk again soon, matey. Thanks very much, Paul. And let me let me end by asking you, have you got a favourite Harryhausen film you'd like us to try and find the trailer of? And for me, it's The Golden Voyage of Sinbad with uh, Tom Baker and the fabulous Caroline Monroe. Your wish is my command. Thank you very much indeed, John Wall, celebrating the genius that was Ray Harryhausen. See the sorcerer of the black arts, the gold helmet faceless vizier, the death fight of the centaur on the griffin, the six-armed goddess of evil, the savage siren on a rampage. <laughs> The duel with the vanishing sorcerer. <laughs> the one-eyed centaur. <laughs> 